First speaker, Eric Tanoe. Everyone, Eric is a key mover and shaker in the floriculture industry. He lobbies the legislature, which is very, very important because as we know, and as I've said before, the new F word is funding. And Eric is able to get the funding, and he works really, really hard to get the funding for the industry to move forward. This workshop is as a result of Eric's efforts to uh, lobby the legislature for grant and aid funding. And um, here he is. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Am, I, am I coming in clear? Well, uh, first, thank you to Sharon uh, for moderating today. And uh, a little bit of background before I start. Um, our industry, we're not professional lobbyists. We're just farmers. Most of us run family farms. Uh, but some of us have to do this, and so reluctantly, we, we do what we do. Yeah, because uh, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? So, but um, what we found is the, the more we do this, the better we get. And the better we get sometimes, hopefully most of the time, the more we get. And so that's just like schooling. That's like teaching. That's, that's like our, our students, right? Uh, our job today is to just inspire them, to hopefully um, inspire them enough. Well, first we've got to inspire you guys, right, first. So that's, that's, uh, that's why we're here today. But inspiring the students to uh, consider agriculture as part of the STEM program. Because agriculture today, you'll hear from a lot of the uh, instructors today, it's all about science. And science is basically a, a um, formal way of confirming something real, truth. Yeah, so if we can do that, then uh, we can get our students into science-based uh, courses, and hopefully we can get them to agriculture. And more specifically today, we hope that we can, they would choose uh, floriculture ornamentals. So uh, without further ado, um, the impacts of floriculture on our lives. Uh, Aloha and thank you uh, all for allowing me the opportunity to share a little about floriculture, our family, business, and our industry. Uh, my name is Eric Tanoe, and I'm the current president of Hawaii Floriculture and Nursery Association. HEFNA, a statewide umbrella organization uh, with approximately 300 members, all family farms from all over the state, and we're primarily in rural areas, so we're providing employment uh, for people that don't want to go to the city. They want to stay in the country. Um, and most of us being family farms, we're not large operations. So we're, we could be your neighbor. Uh, we definitely are shopping at your supermarkets where you shop at, your churches. We're in your pews. Our children go to the same school. It's just you might not realize it, but uh, we're farmers. Uh, and um, some of us don't farm full time. Some of us uh, run, uh, produce seasonal crops, so which don't really, uh, you don't harvest all year round. So some of us have uh, day jobs, and we're doing this maybe possibly on the weekends or after work. Uh, so we're, we come in all different uh, positions, yeah. Uh, our membership is made up of breeders, hybridizers, though, propagators, growers, shippers, wholesalers, retailers, uh, educators, and allied industry, too. And the, the allied people are the people that they might not really farm, but they're the people that support us in what we do. Um, floriculture uh, in 2017 was valued at $77.6 million. And um, we estimate we, we may employ around 2,000 people in our sector. Um, I'm also the president of our family business, uh, Greenpoint Nursery, uh, located on the Big Island. And we're fortunate that we're just starting our third generation. It was founded by my late father, Harold Tadashi Tanoe, in 1976, Greenpoint. It's primarily known for our anthuriums, but we also export uh, and ship uh, tropical flowers and foliages. And our markets are basically within the state, uh, US mainland and uh, a little bit uh, international abroad. I'd like to uh, thank everyone, all of you, for joining us today uh, as attendees and uh, as educators and taking the time to do your travel, to find your substitutes. I know you had to find substitutes today and for the time that you're missing. Also, not being with your students. 
Um, first, uh, thanks to, again, uh, Mrs. Sharon Hurd, uh, HDOA um, Market Development Branch Administrator for helping us uh, with our Hefna's uh, legislative grant and making it possible for this seminar today. So thank you, Sharon. Um, we have with us today also, um, I believe, uh, Kent Dumlao and I'm kind of forgetting uh, Haraguchi. What was your first name again? Rex, Rex Haraguchi from HDOA PQ branch, Plant Quarantine branch. Uh, they're going to be uh, having a small speaking part, but they're going to be uh, pretty much helping us get our flowers and plants back home so that uh, we don't get stuck, yeah? Or, God forbid, uh, spread the invasive pests, yeah, today. We don't want to do that, right? So we have uh, two expert officers that will uh, assist us today. Um, Ms. Allison uh, Inoue, Ali. Uh, HDOE's uh, uh, representative for working with us on this program. Uh, thank you to Ali uh, for the seminar and getting us connected with you guys. Uh, and thanks for showing up uh, through all through the efforts of Ali. So thank you. We also have Mrs. Heather uh, Drawl. Uh, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, thanks for the tip uh, this morning. Um, Director of School and Youth Activities at Longwood Gardens. And so she will be sharing her experiences with her program in Pennsylvania. She came all the way from Pennsylvania, guys. Let's, let's give her a, a clap for that, yeah? And, uh, and, and your husband, what, what, what was his name again? Sorry. Nate? Yeah, Nate also tagged along. So thanks for being the sport, Nate. I know it's tough to get you out of Pennsylvania to Hawaii, but thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, University of Hawaii College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. Yeah, we have uh, Dr. Tessie Amore, we have uh, Dr. Robert Kating, and uh, I didn't see Dr. Andy Kaufman yet, but he'll be here. Uh, they're going to be sharing their manao about all their different disciplines from uh, the University uh, CITAR, yeah, our local campus in uh, Honolulu, but we also have Robert out of uh, Hilo. And Mrs. Kathleen Yoshinaga, who will be sharing uh, her expertise in doing a floral design for us today, uh, a demonstration on how to, how to design a floral box. And you'll all get a box to take home tonight. And you'll be, we'll, we'll explain it more in uh, Kathleen's uh, demonstration, but you'll get a box to take home tonight. Yeah. Um, I'm also fortunate to have my two sons. Uh, yes, uh, I am older. I may look young, but yes, I am older. I have my uh, oldest son uh, who's out with uh, my first son, first grandson, Ethan. He, he was making a little noise, so I think Chris is outside with him. My first son lives here uh, with his wife, Jeremy, and uh, our first grandson, Ethan. And my second son is John, who's uh, our tech right now, helping me over here. So thank you to the two guys. Uh, uh, Chris, Chris graduated out of Honolulu at HPU. He's a nurse. Uh, John graduated out of UH Hilo. He's, he's like me. He's uh, in horticulture. He's the grower. He's the, he's the guy that uh, got to stay at the farm. So today we had to drag him out. So I'm sure his guys are very happy that he, he, had to be, he was called to Honolulu. Um, OK. Saving the best for last. Uh, those uh, that you don't know uh, or may have uh, met uh, briefly is Mrs. Judy Schillings. Uh, Judy is our association administrator uh, assisting us with grant writing and administering these grants and also keeping us all, all of the directors uh, uh, like herding cats. Uh, we're all hard head uh, independent people so she, she kind of keeps us together and she's here with us today so thank you Judy for uh, coming out to Honolulu with us. Lastly, I didn't want to forget but uh, we have um, given a shout out to uh, Mr. Russell uh, Galanti, and he's your new Honolulu or Oahu extension, floriculture ornamental extension agent on Oahu. So you got to get to know this guy. If you're from Honolulu, this is your man. He's going to be connecting you with uh, also um, the CITAR, yeah? And we have Nicole uh, Pfeiffer. I was going to say uh, Pfeiffer, but Pfeiffer. And she's with DOA. Uh, she's supporting Sharon today. So thanks, Nicole. Okay. So. Um, I'm going to tell you a short story then. Uh, this is a kind of a small personal story about me. When I, one thing I remember when I was really young, I, was, I may have been about like six or seven years old, and my dad would wake me up early in the morning. This was probably on a Saturday. So waking up 
early on a Saturday, six or seven, it was still a pain. He'd wake me up and he'd take me riding. So what I remember is going, jumping in the car and going riding to his first nursery that he started in Mountain View. And uh, this nursery in Mountain View was about 1,500 feet elevation. So depending on when we went, uh, it could be raining or it could be sunny and hot. So you never knew what weather was like in Mountain View. Um, winters were dreary, rainy and cloudy. Summers were really, really hot. So yeah, it was basically a farm. You know, I was going to the farm. Yeah. Um, this, would, this, this usually trip would occur on a Saturday. So when I'd go with him, no, not too many people would be working on a Saturday. So what he'd do is he, he was there primarily to check the farm and set up his schedule for the, the coming week. My job was to, I guess, keep him company. So he would plop me down in one of the shade houses, give me an empty bucket, like a five gallon bucket, and teach me the art of weeding. <laughs> so he, he taught me how to weed and clean around the plants at a young age. And six or seven years old, yeah, um, must have been tough for him. But uh, I'd stay maybe for half an hour to an hour, weed, clean around the plants, and he'd come back and pick me up. But the, the trick to this is, I think he was training me uh, because um, what he did was if I didn't fill up the bucket with rocks, branches, or other rubbish, and I filled it up with weeds, I'd get a treat. And so the treat normally was like a popsicle. I mean, if you're six or seven, an ice cold popsicle after the farm on the way home, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to come every week with you, Dad. So, so definitely he was training me, I think. And the incentive was. Uh, Bribery, I think, but uh, he was he was I think uh, teaching me a lesson you, you do a little work, but uh, enjoy yourself too um, Aging farmer While I may have started my farming career early some of you may know agriculture has an aging farmer concern The average age of a farm operator in Hawaii and the nation is a little over 60 years old right now this is why in five and definitely 10 years from now, we will start possibly seeing a decline in farmers and ranchers. If we do not get the next generation or the next group of farmers coming into agriculture, this is a concern for all farmers and ranchers nationwide right now. Where will the next generation come from? I remember when my father started Greenpoint Nurseries, he allowed me to become his partner. He understood that starting a nursery required a lot of sacrifice in time and the willingness to invest in the future. It wasn't a decision he could make for me, but a decision I had to make for myself. Since I'm here before you, you probably assume and can guess what my decision was. Farming always is an opportunity. Most farmers and ranchers are very optimistic people. For those who are willing to put in the work and invest in themselves, farming is a lifetime of learning. Farming and ranching, yeah? Because we're considered the jack of all trades kind of people, yeah? We, do, we have to learn how to do everything. For us at Greenpoint, we see ourselves as agri-business people, which is something a little different. My father told me early on that we need to constantly innovate or we won't be around for long, which is what we continue to do and is a constant practice of entrepreneurism, market demand. On the flip side of the aging farmer issue is that we experience a huge right now growing demand in Hawaii and nationwide, a, dem a demand that is not being met in Hawaii or nationwide either right now. Huge, huge demand for quality agricultural products right now. At Greenpoint, we are currently selling every stem of flower and foliage we can get our hands on right now. And we're selling it at profitable prices. And the future demand looks very, very promising as well, taking into consideration the millennials, those born between 1982 and 2002. 
who are now about in their 20s and 30s. The millennial generation is larger than that of the baby boomers. There's guys like us. I might be on the tail end. I'm young yet, but I might be on the tail end. Still considered a baby boomer. Yeah, those born between 1946 to 1964. We were the largest demographic that walked the earth. Not anymore. On the tails of the millennials is generation or Gen Z. That's the group born from 1996 to 2010, which currently makes up about 26% of the U.S. population. And by 2020 now, I repeat, by 2020, there'll be one third of the U.S. population. It's huge. With consumer spending making 70% of our economy today, having these two generations back to back creates a huge customer base, huge. And with the coming of a huge customer base, corporate America, as well as corporations worldwide, have great optimism right now. So to put it simply, we have a shrinking supply, assuming that we, we're gonna have a shrinking supply of farmers and ranchers, but we're gonna have a growing demand for the next two generations. This spells opportunity for entrepreneurial individuals in your classrooms. Even if these guys or girls are at middle school age, they are, they are already showing you entrepreneurial characteristics. You are starting to see that in them. They're, they're the people that have a strong desire that they, they know what they want, they know what they like, and they're gonna go and do it. Th these individuals are demonstrating already at your age. They might be hard hit, they might be combative, but that's what you need to be as an entrepreneur and going into agriculture. You have to have that spirit. And so you're, you're seeing it now, you, you're just thinking, man, I can't get through to this kid. But they're actually showing you, they might be showing you something that's already developing in them. And that's a sign you guys need to look out for. So you might want to test them, give them a project, let them do something. Small wins, small gains. Develop their confidence in themselves so they believe in what they feel or what they want to accomplish. It's very, very important at this age. Okay, so. To put it simply, we have a shrinking supply, a growing demand for the next two generations. This spells opportunity for entrepreneurial individuals in your classrooms to apply science. So going into a science-based career and possibly applying it to an affordable luxury. Because the product that we grow is not edible. Most of the product is not edible. I mean, we joke about it, but you really can't eat it. It's affordable luxury, okay? So you gotta have quality in our game because you don't wanna grow our stuff and sell cheap. That's not where you're gonna make profit. You gotta grow good quality product, what the market wants, at profitable prices. You need to be willing to see the, this opportunity. Greenpoint Nurseries uh, was not my father's first nursery. It was my second, uh, it was his second nursery that uh, was started, yeah? He resigned from his first nursery because uh, his, my grandfather and my uncle and my father didn't agree. And one of the things they didn't agree on was the direction of where to take the company. And my grandfather and my uncle wanted to go high volume, low price. And my father said, that's not going to work. And this was in the 60s, the early 70s. This is uh, maybe 65 to 75. This is where he was. He was already knowing that in Hawaii, you gotta grow premium product already. Uh, so he started Greenpoint Nurseries in Paneva, which is where I started with him, um, which is closer to Hilo, one move, closer to the uh, market, uh, closer to the population center, was down at a lower elevation because he wanted to grow Anthurium for the winter market of the United States. He already knew out in uh, Mountain View at 1,500 feet elevation, 
it's cold, it's rainy and cloudy, and the production goes down when the market wants it. So he went down to 300 feet elevation to grow more anthurium, red particular in color for the American market, because he knew that was where the money was going to be made. Yep. So my father enjoyed growing anthuriums and having that opportunity to share these flowers with others. During his college years, he told me a story. He said he went over, you know, he went to uh, Grinnell College. He went to Iowa, and so to that far away from Hawaii, most of these guys never, guys or girls, never came back. They went there, and uh, yeah, most 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 of the uh, fam families were not really wealthy. So you went out to school and you never came back. So you stayed four or five years out there. So that means Christmas breaks or winter breaks, you stayed with friends, families. Uh, you, di you didn't come home for, for uh, Christmas. Yeah. So what my grandmother would do was send flowers, pineapples, I guess, but she, she used to send boxes of anthurium to the hostess. And my father, the one thing that he remembered was that the hostess always thought, wow, never saw these flowers before, grown in Hawaii. Are they real? So they touch the flower, oh, they're real. They feel like plastic, they're so shiny. It had never... It never dawned on them the, how special the flowers were until they found out that these flowers can last months in a vase with water. So they, and so they thought, oh, this, this, this flower doesn't dirty water. It lasts so long. This, this, these are great flowers from Hawaii. So when my father came back from school, that's what he remembers. And, and so he felt he wanted to go into in terms to commercialize the crop because he felt there was a big demand for this product on the mainland, perishable product. Yeah. He taught me, you can't be afraid of doing what you really truly enjoy and to, ha and to believe in yourself. So I'm going to repeat that again. He taught me, you can't be afraid of doing what you truly enjoy and have, and have to believe in yourself as well. So this is another trait, uh, another teaching, teaching moment for your students at that age. If you see them wanting to do something and you help them achieve a, a project or uh, a report, um, if they write or they do something that, about something they really enjoy, that could be the, the start of them to consider going into agriculture or going to floriculture ornamentals and doing something maybe they really enjoy. Not being the dentist your father wanted you to be. That was me. <laughs> Market focus. I just couldn't think of all my life looking at people's mouths. I just, I just, I just and that wasn't me. Market focus. The next thing uh, you may be wondering, who do we sell this in-demand product to? We market them directly to floral designers, um, interior scapers, wholesale distributors, but to the high-end consumer. So we're looking not for the race to the bottom, we're, we're taking that um, hike to the top of that hill. Because we want to get to the top of the hill because then, the, then you can get to the next top of the hill. Okay, which is primarily for weddings, uh, special lifestyle events, uh, if, you go, if you're going with wholesale distribution, you, if you're working with corporate, then it's going to events, corporate events, incentive travel, a lot of these type of uh, conventions where the money is, where they're willing to spend the money. Our industry plants, they can be seen in hotels, malls, and celebrity homes. The reason why they buy Hawaii plants is because, number one, they're beautiful. Uh, Hawaii plants are grown longer. They're more specimen, so they last longer. Our media is good. Our roots are more mature. Our plants are bigger. Uh, but the key thing for the internal, the guys like interior scapers or the guys that are doing landscape who buy the plants, the reason why they buy and they like to buy from Hawaii is because you don't have to change the plants out. You might have to change the plants out in, it, the plants in other words grow twice as long than the, the other stuff, maybe coming out of Florida, not to pick on the Floridians, but that's why they're willing to pay more money for Hawaii plants, because the change out is less. So if you have less change out, you have less labor, you have less plant cost, 
and you're out of production less time, so it's easier to manage those jobs. It's very important. It has to make sense, right? right? It has to make economic sense. And this all based on quality. So there is a feeling of accomplishment to see your products on display. Uh, that's what turns me on. Um, and that's, that's what plant growers, that's what they love to see when they see their plants in Bellagio, or if we see our flowers in Vegas, you know, at one of these high-end resorts. Uh, when they're using our product and you go visit those resorts or you go to a, a mall and you see your plants in there, you, you really feel a sense of well, satisfaction, like, wow, look, this is what our product is looking like. This is what it's all about. This is why we do what we do. And so hopefully, enjoyed by the next generation, uh, and the next generation decides to go into floriculture, run their businesses wisely, or their careers, uh, produce quality, desirable products, and most likely, they will succeed. It's um, pretty much that's fundamental. It's that simple. Um, competing in the global market. Besides selling our products here in Hawaii, the mainland is our key export market right now, where roughly 50% of Hawaii goods gets exported out of the state. And when this inventory is sold, it brings in valuable outside dollars. So I just want to say, uh, I sometimes hear people saying, uh, we shouldn't support people who grow product in Hawaii for export because our local people are not benefiting. That's not really true. When, as a producer, if I want to grow more product quantity, more selection quality for this state of Hawaii, I need to grow my business because I need volume to cover this state competently with consistent quality supply. If, you, if you're small, you cannot do it consistently. You just don't have the volume. You don't have the rotating space to do that. So we need export. So we export certain things during certain periods of the year and within uh, the planting cycle, certain products, how much volume we plant, we, we're gearing to export. So, that, so, the, so the upside is, yeah, maybe we can export, we can make a sale out of the state of Hawaii. But the, uh, the other upside is that we're going to have the volume to feed this state. So we don't have to bring in product because we don't have it. Um, so I kind of want you to realize, or at least hear it from me, and you, you can believe it or not, that export is not bad for the state of Hawaii. Export is good for the state of Hawaii because it means that more export means more product for local consumption too. Um, our industry has been um, working with uh, HDOA uh, very closely these past few years on their Buy Local It Matters and import replacement programs. Uh, these programs seek to help our industry by increasing demand for local Hawaiian grown products and also for export. Um, again, I, all, what I want to say, sh just sh a short ad maybe for DOA on this is, by local it matters, it's an internal program. It's to get the local people to support local production. But it, but it also has a positive rub on the import replacement because the import replacement program is where we have a pent up demand for something that we already purchase in Hawaii. But if our growers grow that locally, we can offer better quality. We can cut closer to market time. Um, and so the import replacement just gives more economic benefit to the local producers too. Now with more diversity and more volume, that's, that's the, the benefit where we benefit also for the export. So this buy local for local consumption, but also import replacement for local consumption, it's, in, it's it's vitally important, it's like a glove uh, fit, because it helps our growers expand both locally and for export. Um, and the, and the, the, popular, the popular, I think, phrase today is, if, if we produce import replacement product locally, that means if we don't have to bring in product, that means we don't import invasive pests, whether it's international importation 
or stuff coming out of, uh, we pick on the Californians this time, yeah. Um, all of the invasive pests coming in is because we're importing. It's coming in because we're importing. But if we produce it here for our local demand, we don't have to bring it in. And if you don't bring it in, the less you bring in, the more you produce locally, you don't bring in, uh, the likelihood of bringing in less invasive is probably positive, yeah. Okay. Um, so by the way, floral designers thrive on social media. How many of you are on Facebook, Instagram? Okay, great, I see some hands coming up. Great, good, good. Um, social media is a global platform. Yeah, everybody knows this. It's how our floral designers or our interior scapers, the people that actually pay the price, buy the product and actually use the product for their commercial work. That's where they are, because on social media, that's where they're showcasing and promoting their work to, to, to their customers, um, especially on Instagram. So growers need to embrace social media, like Facebook and Instagram, um, as a way of engaging your customer. Um, now, the high-end customer is on social media. Um, a lot of times, the low-end customers are not on social media because the low-end customers, they're relying on volume and price to bring in the customer. The high-end customers, they only want certain type of uh, customers or um, the high-end producers or sellers, they only want their type of customer base to attract to them because they're, they're the ones who are, gonna, who are gonna pay the price. So social media is gonna be really, really critical for this uh, next, uh, next stage of growth. And this is where the next generation should thrive in this environment because they're all on uh, mobile devices. They're, they're, I mean, social media is second nature to them. So if they get into the, uh, agriculture or floriculture ornamentals, anything that has eye candy, a lot of color, a lot of texture and um, affordable luxury, it's gonna work for them. Hawaii brand. So, upscale New York floral designer, Chelsea Neff, was quoted in a New York Times article saying, I gravitate to tropical plants like protea, palm trees, and thuriums to distinguish myself from the 1-800 flowers crowd. And I envy my Hawaii friends who grew up with these plants growing in their backyards. The Hawaii brand image is not only about being beautiful and unique, it's also about quality. An interim from Hawaii can last for months in a vase. Uh, that's the value of the Hawaii brand. Smart designers or interior scapers know this. You could argue that the Hawaii brand is the strongest brand in the world. When our industry works with our hospitality industry, that's a, a positive connection. Finding synergism, uh, our stock goes up. Anytime we work with HTA or HVCB, anytime we do something with um, tourism, we win. The potential here is tremendous. And those students who want to become marketers have a fantastic potential in their careers in this area. Because most, most agricultural uh, people were not working with the tourism sector at all, zero. And if you have marketers that want to connect agriculture with tourism, this is a big, big void right now. Our, our main industry in Hawaii um, enjoys green space, enjoys flowers and plants, enjoys all the benefits yeah, of uh, what we pr bring to the table. But we're not marketing to tourism right now. Uh, I would say very little. On the private sector, we do. I mean, we're marketing lays, we're marketing flowers to the hotels, we're, we're doing um, events, but uh, as an industry, no, we're not there yet. Huge potential here. Um, to compete and grow our share in the global market, we would close, uh, we work closely with our R&D partners. So these guys would be the UH CTAR people. We also work with PBARC, yeah, Pacific Basin Agriculture Research Center. Uh, CTAR's um, R&D program supports our industry by creating flowers of new color and shapes, so new, new textures. Um, some of them got sent too. Uh, we're just kind of entering that area right now to appeal to the target market or that upscale uh, designers. 
They also develop new flowers that are disease tolerant, like this beautiful mana loa. Many of their anthuriums have won blue ribbons uh, in the annual Society of American Florists Outstanding Varieties competition. These world-class flowers unique to Hawaii gives our industry a sustained competitive advantage. The UH Sitar breeding program was started in the 1950s by Professor Emeritus Dr. Haruyuki Kamimoto. We have a long history and we will continue to work together as a successful uh, public-private partnership. And with the program under the guidance of now Dr. Tessie Amori, we see a very bright future. So Tessie, wave your hand. That's Tessie. Thank you, Tessie. OK, so sitar uh, ribbon winners. Yeah, This is Dr. Uh, Kamimoto on the far left. Yeah, And my dad next to him, that's me. Yeah, that, that's actually me. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Heidi Kundli. Uh, who, who was uh, uh, head of the breeding program after Ka Dr. Kamimoto. So this is Hokuloa white. This is all, these are uh, UH varieties. Uh, Marin Seaford pink. Kawaii light green. Tropic lime, different shapes. Tropic fire red. Lavender Lady, and um, Mauna Loa, Obake. Future for Greenpoint, to so give you kind of an example of what we're doing a little bit. One must always remember that you, we, you are part of a community. You're never alone. Besides our own production, we support many producers by selling product for them. It's a win-win situation. And some producers growing flowers and plants uh, want to just do that. They just want to grow. They don't want to uh, market. They don't want to ship. Uh, so it's a win-win situation because most of these growers are trying to look for a connection on how do I grow but sell my stuff to somebody else. Um, so we purchase and we market for them and their, uh, and their products help us fill a, a larger, broader demand because we cannot grow the diversity of products that uh, is available in our industry. So we try and partner with many. So for a company like ours, we might have 50 to 100 family farms, other entities that we, we are buying from every week throughout the year. And what's good about that is uh, seasonal products can come in and out of production. So, so if you're growing a seasonal that only grows for three months, well, you're in for three months. When you get out, you're done. And then we go to other growers and then they, they do something else. Uh, so it's a win-win because some growers, they don't want to do it full-time all year round. And what we do primarily is grow, ship. So we got to clean, we got to solve logistical problems. And then you, got, you have to market, yeah? So you have to also collect um, from whoever you're selling to. And not all growers want to do that. So it's a win-win situation. So for students that want to become and do what we do, the opportunities to, to not only be just a grower. So you're not just looking at the dirt. Um, you might be actually becoming an agribusiness person. You might be a manager of an operation. You, can, you might be a marketer. Or, or if you're an entrepreneur, then you might want to do all of it. And if you're capable, you can do all of it. The potential is good, uh, wide open. So adaptation. So there's... Um, in this age of climate change, um, with the growing demand of natural resources, we decided to put green into Greenpoint. We installed PV panels on two of our nurseries uh, recently. Um, and all the irrigation on one of our nurseries, our rain, we catch rainwater off the roof. So we catch the rainwater off the roof, and we collect it in above ground uh, reservoirs on one of our nurseries. Uh, combined with uh, um, PV or electricity, we produce our own power. And so we basically what this allows us to do is we're, um, we're lowering our costs, number one. For, for the business person, we're trying to be more sustainable. So if you're lowering your cost, you can be more competitive or you can be more profitable. 
On the other hand, we do this because it's uh, environmentally friendly and everybody should be doing their share of trying to um, use technology that's available to us. Um, and so we're trying to keep up you know, with um, whatever technology is affordable. This is our uh, Kurdistan location. The previous was Paneva location. Yeah. So this is uh, at about 900 feet elevation. So it's a little bit cooler, a little bit uh, more cloud cover. But you see the ponds. It's, uh, we catch the water off the roof, collect them in gutters. They're draining in two ponds. So we have about 2 million gallons of stored water, enough for about four, at, le at least four months of a drought we're engineered for. So we never had to buy water. We're collecting the water adequately right now. On our other nursery, we have county water. So we, we, we're not at risk of getting cut off here because in Hilo, plenty of water. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so um, what I want to do real quick is um, I actually, because I'm lucky and I have uh, John here and I have Chris somewhere out there, I want to actually ask them to come up and share a little bit of my time and share with you. I guess the question is, we, we're fortunate. We have the next generation coming in with us. So my wife, Lolita, and I are really, really happy. and before the passing of my father, who's our founder and entrepreneur, um, he was really happy to see that the next generation was coming in. But the real big question right now for you guys when you're looking at your middle school students or high school students, uh, but is who's going to be the farmer? Who's going to go into agriculture? Um, well, for us, because we are farmers, because we're in the business, it was sort of one of the, the things on my checklist. I needed to solve generation succession. So, so I, I, I kind of did that. So I, I checked it off already, OK? There's no, there, there's no doubt. I checked it off already. So that's one of the things I did. But I, the question that I want you guys to ask yourselves is when they're speaking is, why did they come into a family business? Or why did they go into agriculture? Um, Chris, I, I don't know if I mentioned, but he graduated from HPO. He, he's actually a registered nurse, but he decided to come into the family business. So he's not really practicing yet, only, only, only a practical. He's doing a practical right now. <laughs> but John is a horticulturalist, yeah? so he went through the training. And, but he, so he was most likely to come in, but we basically convinced Chris to come in too. And uh, fortunately, both of them came in. So, um, Shall I ask, uh, Chris, you want to come up first? Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris, um, Eric's oldest and first son. And I guess my journey coming into the business, it started, I guess, with us being there all the time. <laughs> I guess when we were younger, we'd be at the farm. And after, schools, after school was finished, um, the bus would drop us off, we'd do our homework, and then we'd be able to play. And uh, oh, and this is Ethan, everyone, my son. <laughs> and from there, I guess once I hit 14 and got permitted and was legal to work, um, Dad put us on the farm to learn what I learned now, or what I saw was uh, what honest hard work is. And there were times where I did not want to go to work because you'd be literally holding a shovel all day for eight hours in the sun, but I made it. <laughs> and from there, um, we'd work every summer. Every, oh, I worked every summer from 14 on until I started going to school. And uh, my dad was good. He did not force me to come into the business or pressure me at all. He kind of let me go out uh, try and pick a major or something that interests me. And uh, that's what I did. So I went to school and I got my BSN, my Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And tried that out for a little while, but um, yeah, the nursery was always in the back of my mind. And um, 
from there, I eventually decided to come back. Uh, for me, it felt like an honorable thing to do because my grandfather started the business, got everything rolling, made tremendous sacrifices. Um, when my dad came in, he was very innovative and I guess took the business to the next level, so to speak. And uh, hmm, let's see. Yeah, I decided that maybe that was a good good idea to come in because um, one thing I realized again once I got older was uh, with my dad's hard work, the business actually was able to give us everything that we needed and a little bit more. And I was very grateful for that. Yeah. And, um, and for me, in honor of my grandpa, was uh, no, no, no. it was a very good reason to step in and jump in and help the business as best as I can. And this is John. Morning everybody, I'm John, so my second son, um, third generation coming in our family business. I could go on for a while, but I'll keep it short. Um, as Chris stated, we were basically born and raised from infant to teenage years to uh, now our adult years in the business. We witnessed firsthand the hardships, the sacrifices our parents did, as well as we had to be there too. Um, and it shows, I guess that it felt normal for us to want to go into the family business. Farming is not getting any easier. It's getting difficult. Um, I guess I like to lead to that direction to, as you guys are some of the most important people in our communities to support ag. Um, we, we need a lot of help in this time. Um, for me, uh, I remember all my teachers in school and I remember them dearly. I feel they're really important in my upbringings. Um, and you guys can do the same. I was never a straight A student. I was more of a hands-on student. Uh, get in trouble a lot and one thing, I guess, on that part of me made it easy to get into the business. I'm a production guy. I, I manage uh, all 30 acres pr growing production, as you saw. Um, but the thing about a small family business is you don't just become a, a farm, a grower. You become an entrepreneur. You become your own HR department. You become your own accountant. You become your own hiring section. I could go on. You do have it all, and I'm sure you have students, too, that would be highly interested in these things. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Talk to my dad. Whatever they did, it worked on us. <laughs> but they did honestly show us. They never forced us to do anything, but showed us the hard work to Anything you do, do it well, and you will succeed. And um, Support egg. We're in a changing time. I, I could go on again about this. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll end it there so we can continue. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you don't need this. One. Yeah. No, they, can put, they can put something on you. Thank you, John. So at this time, uh, John actually is going to uh, do a demonstration and. And we'll actually ask you to do a demonstration uh, with John, but you're actually going to do it actually at your table. So you're going to actually transplant tissue culture material as part of the class. Um, well, basically, this is a put together tissue culture box uh, by Dr. Tessie Amori. Are you still handing out stuff? You guys are okay? Uh, Tessie will go into depth into how this is created. Uh, I'll leave that up to there. I don't want to jump ahead of the gun. But basically from a sterile container, a sterile lab, we're going to basically step it out of that sterile environment and expose it to the environment. And what we are handed today is basic, another basic thing is we're making a mini terrarium to acclimate it, they like to call it, to get it adjusted to the natural environment and not make it get kind of shocked from um, being explanted. We can start with the first thing. Um, well, your pot is already filled up. If you want, if it feels a little higher than halfway of the pot, we can press it down. Because these plants are a little taller. And then we move to step two. They are, they are moistened, am I correct? Yeah. They're, they're already wet? They are okay. So we'll move on to step three. You can follow your instructions. So we can um, 
Open up your chopsticks. We'll use the chopsticks to poke them out. And go ahead and, I think these are sealed. Let's go ahead and take off all the f uh, film on the edges so we can get access to the plants. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> so the plants are grown in a gel auger media, so totally safe. It feels like jello, a little bit watery. So once we open this cap to this container, go ahead and just fish it out as in the instructions. And uh, you can put it straight into your bowls of water you got. So if you watch me, I'll just kind of gently loosen it up from the container if it is too, sometimes it pops out really easily. Just gonna use it like you're eating some uh, sushi right now. Just dump it right into your container, then we can wash off the, the auger. Oh, these are really nice plants, Tessie. Very nice. Really easy to work with. <clears throat> if there isn't any too much uh, of the gel on the plants, you can rinse it off. And we're going to put roughly about five plants in a pot. Can we put a little more? Or five is good? Five, yeah. Maybe we can do another one if you want. We go up, let's go up to six. Yeah. So they're all pretty uniform size, so go ahead and just rinse off any gel and you can place about five or six on the side. What we're going to do in the media is we're going to use the chopstick. You're going to poke a little hole. So you kind of want to space them out really evenly. You kind of dig a little hole with your chopstick. And if you look really quick, I'll show you the, the plant. All these bottom roots, if you look at it, is roots. So you want to go, we can plant it pretty much to the highest root on your plant lid. Uh, yeah, what I like to do is I poke it in there, make a little hole. You're going to stick the plant in there with your chopsticks to help push the roots inside and then use it to cover, cover up the roots. All right, the last step, so I think many people are wondering, how do we water it? How do we take care of it? So they're handing out some, some of this uh, saran wrap and maybe some rubber bands too. So what you're going to do, as I said earlier, we're making a mini terrarium-like thing. So you, you're going to put it over your top, wrap it pretty tight, and put a rubber band on it. From then on, is in the instructions you receive, if you're going to keep it in your house or office, by a window with some morning or afternoon sun, but you don't want it all day hitting sun. Um, or if you have a shade house, 80, 60 to 80 percent shade is preferably good. Um, this will self-water it. Once you start seeing it get a little bigger, it starts fully covering the plastic, then you can take the plastic off, uh, let it grow a little bit more, and then you can put it into a bigger pot if you like. Mm -hmm.